Hi, welcome to the Zen Vesting Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton. Let's start exploring. Welcome to the Zen Vesting Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton, and I'm really excited about today's guest, Dr. 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 Kim Tan. Now, I'm going to probably slaughter his bio with my Tennessee accent, but he has a very impressive bio. Dr. Kim Tan is chairman of Spring Hill Management, a private fund management company specializing in biotech and social venture capital investments. Spring Hill BioVentures invest in early stage biotech companies in Asia, India, UK, and the US. Dr. Kim Tan has been a pioneer of social impact investing for over 20 years and is a partner of several social impact funds. He is an advisor to Johnson & Johnson Impact Ventures. He's the co-founder of the Transformational Business Network and a trustee of the John Templeton Foundation, Templeton Religion Trust, and the Center for Enterprise, Markets, and Ethics in Oxford, England. He was the founder chairman of NCI Cancer Hospital in Malaysia and the inventor of the sheep monoclonal antibodies licensed to major diagnostic companies. Dr. Tan developed the first rapid test for Salmonella enteritidis and Salmonella typemurium in egg, chickens and eggs and for atrazine pesticide in drinking water. He is a pro-chancellor of Surrey University in the UK and a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine in the UK. He has a PhD in biochemistry and three postdoctoral fellowships from the Medical Research Council. He was conferred a dato by the governor of Penang in 2007 and was the recipient of the Guilford Roll of Honor in 2014 and the Beacon Award for Impact Investment in 2017. Welcome, Dr. Tan. Thank you, you, Lauren. Can you please tell the audience what it means to be conferred the title of Dato? Oh, that's a kind of Malaysian uh, honor, uh, I suppose, equivalent to the English Sir uh, in, in, in the UK for service to, to the country. Uh, means nothing outside of Malaysia. Did you have a ceremony when you were conferred the yes, title? Yes, yes, I had a, a small private ceremony uh, at the uh, at the palace in uh, in in Penang. Wow, that fun. is sounds really fun, and I'm sure your family was very proud. I read that you were one of ten children, and that you grew up in Malaysia. Can you tell me a little bit about growing up in Malaysia, what it was like, and how that has influenced your career and your investment strategy? Yeah, I mean, dad was an immigrant from China to Malaysia at the age of 18. Um, his parents, his father died when he was 13 and had to go out of work uh, selling crockery and pottery and so on. Then at the age of 18, put himself on a on a boat to, to Malaysia um, because of, of the sheer poverty in South China. So it started out doing laboring work and then saved money and eventually built a small business. Uh, and I grew up in, in, in that business um, in rural Malaysia. Uh, it was a tin shack uh, with a well in the, in the backyard. Uh, so we we grew up we grew up poor. We were surrounded by by poverty, and I suppose that has had a major influence on on me and and the things that that I've been doing the last twenty years. But I saw the power of what a small enterprise could do, because from that one business, my father, because he was uneducated, wanted all his children to be educated. So eight out of ten children were sent to the UK. Uh, for wow. studies, um, and that was just funded out of this, out of this business. So I saw the power of of what enterprise could do, 
uh, well, that is revolution. remarkable. Yeah, sure. We were lucky too in that, you know, with the generosity of the British government with scholarships and, you know, um, for, for not only our, our graduate work, but also postgraduate and postdoctorate work. Uh, so the generosity of the British government as well has to be acknowledged. I can't imagine being responsible for educating 10 children. 10 children, <laughs> exactly. Neither can I. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. Um, tell me about your father's business. What type of business was it? And um, I'm assuming you worked in the business. Uh, what did you learn from doing that? Absolutely. So um, it, we were in, surrounded by robber estates. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, he started out uh, selling fruit and vegetables and, and then saved enough money to start a provision shop. So selling groceries and then ended up doing uh, wholesaling of rice and flour and oil and sugar and then bought a, a, a couple of, of probably beaten up trucks uh, and started transporting rubber latex from the plantation to the ports and then bringing, you know, grocery uh, uh, rice and, and sugar and flour back. Um, and and that, was his, that was his business, wholesale uh, eventually. Um, and we went to school in the mornings uh, and in the afternoon, we didn't have any sport activities. We would work in a shop. Um, and, and we learned, we learned how, to, we learned how to speak Tamil because most of the, uh, a lot of the customers were, were Tamil speaking. Um, and, and you learn a variety of different languages and dialects because you've got to serve the customer. Right. Um, so it was, uh, it was fun growing up in that kind of environment. That's a, it's an amazing story about the business your father built and educating you kids. I think that is just wonderful. I can imagine it's had a big impact on you. Tell me, um, do you often go back to Malaysia? Do you have family there? Yeah, I still have family there. And, um, you know, pre the pandemic, I'll be out there maybe six times a year. Oh. Uh, although when I was building uh my cancer hospital, I was there once every month. Uh, wow. Did that for about seven years uh, because we were building it from scratch. Well, I want to dive into the cancer hospital at some point during the interview, but tell me about the business environment in Malaysia. What is it like doing business in Malaysia? What is investment like in Malaysia? Describe the country for my listeners. We started out really in the ag agricultural sector. So, uh, rubber initially and then oil palms so so those were the the sort of major export from the country but in the 60s uh there was a big transition into industrialization so i think today most of our export the majority of exports are actually now finished goods uh so intel for instance has a big plant in penang and there's a DHL flight out of Penang every day. Uh, and um, Dell, uh, um, I think, yeah, I think it's Dell uh, or Compact has a, a plant there as well. And, you know, your, your laptop can be delivered to you to spec from Penang within four days. So, wow. so, so, so there's been a transition. So now the majority of the business uh, in terms of export uh, around finished goods. But with the pandemic, of course, the, the major product has been uh, gloves, rubber oh. gloves. It has been a major, major exporter of, of, of latex and rubber gloves. Uh, Fascinating. And does Malaysia have the education to support these efforts? What is education like in Malaysia? Improving all the time, Lauren. Oh. You might have to switch this off. <laughs> That's okay. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, it, it, education is, is, is improving, uh, but a lot of our, our um, you know, students would go overseas uh, to study. So UK, Australia are pretty popular. So is the US uh, and Canada. Um, so certainly for uh, postgraduate work, 
uh, we, we still don't have enough strength in that area. So a lot of postgraduate work is, is done outside of the country. Um, uh, I would say in terms of the environment, it's, it's, it's pretty benign. It's, um, it's an ex-British colony. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, the laws are very similar uh, to, to the UK, uh, very similar to Singapore as well, uh, because Singapore was originally part of, part of Malaysia uh, until it went independent. So the, the, the sort of culture and um, um, law for, for business, very, very similar. We would say Singaporeans might be sharper and more efficient, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe less they have better shopping. <laughs> A lot better shopping, uh, but very similar in terms of, of ease of doing business. My youngest daughter has been dying to go to Malaysia, and oh. um, it's a surprising answer coming out of a young child. Where do you want to go? I want to go to Malaysia. And I say, well, why do you want to go to Malaysia? And she said, well, there's a Hello Kitty land over in Malaysia, <laughs> and I want to go visit it. I think right. it closed prior to the pandemic, but All right. that was on her list of um her bucket list for many, many years, I should say. We're well, beautiful can... islands. Yeah. You know, so shopping is great, but islands is, you know, and great food. Yeah, I would love to visit one day. I've been to Singapore, but I have not been to Malaysia. So I need to come visit. Now, it seems like reading your bio that you started out in for-profit and then moved over to venture and venture capital investing and then move to social impact investing. So can you tell me about your journey from for-profit to social impact investing? I've read a little bit about your uh, road to Damascus moment um, that you had in South Africa. Maybe share that um, with our listeners today. Well, I've had three careers, Lauren. First was in academia. You know, that's why after my PhD, I did the, the postdoctorate thinking I was going to be an academic and be a professor at some stage. And then after the, my third um, postdoctorate, I just realized that I just wasn't smart enough really to, to be a top flight scientist. Right. So I bailed out and, and my second career was in biotech. Um, and, um, and out of that ended up not only investing in companies and selling them and uh, ended up running a, a biotech VC fund. Uh, on behalf actually of the Malaysian government. And it was on a trip to, to South Africa 20 years or so ago, um, taking a family on a holiday, took them into this, this huge slum in South Africa. And I just became disillusioned with my own philanthropy. And, you know, we went with a really good large NGO uh, with good people, good intention, good hearted people. But what I saw was them helping people, teaching people to make clothes by hand, furniture by hand, shoes by hand, craft by hand. And, you know, we, we just end up with these poor quality products that we buy out of pity. And I, I saw then that when you buy things out of pity, it doesn't confer dignity on, on the people who, who make these products. And, and I said to, to, to the people who were taking us in to say, why don't you have a factory, have some proper machinery, improve the quality and so on. They said, well, we don't know how to run a business. And it was at that moment that I recall really what had happened to the tiger economies in, in Asia. You know, without aid, uh, without charity, without family offices really still in Asia, you know, they've transformed their, their, their economies. And 45 years ago, the GDP of Ghana and, and Kenya was higher than the GDP of Singapore, Malaysia, <laughs> Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand. You know, and, and here in Africa, we've received the equivalent of about $3 trillion in aid, excluding charity. I don't know how much charity has gone into Africa. So, so that was the beginning of, of a transition, you know, and, and when you've made enough money, um, you know, you could, you, you, you know, one would be tempted to go on making more, but I just felt that with the kind of experience I've gained from, you know, running a VC fund and, 
and having built businesses from scratch, uh, I thought you know, it was time to sort of use the experience to see if we could build, intentionally build businesses uh, amongst the poor, for the poor, providing goods and services for the poor um, as, a, as a more sustainable way of uh, lifting them out of poverty. So some 20 years ago, I, I, I started and there was no terminology then. And I called it social venture capital because that was the background I'd come from. Um, so you use the discipline of, of the VC, but you're not expecting a VC type return. Um, but you're now looking also for a social return. What's the social impact? Uh, how are you providing goods and services for the poor? How are you impacting the environment for good? How are you uh, creating jobs in, in areas of, an, uh, of endemic uh, unemployment? Yeah, I love that. Free enterprise solutions to yeah. solving global poverty. I do think, um, you know, although a lot of times in a lot of conversations, capitalism gets a very uh, bad rap, but there's so many virtues of capitalism. Yeah. There is a morality of capitalism. Can you speak a bit about the virtues of capitalism and um, how you integrate that into your social investing strategies in the businesses that you're funding and, and looking to fund? You know, the, the, the great thing about capitalism is individual responsibility. And uh, private ownership is, is absolute key. If, if there is no private ownership, it's actually very hard uh, to, to see development. You know, if, if nobody owns anything, eventually the whole thing falls apart. And this is the whole thing that we're seeing with charities, right? You go in and build a school, you go and build a, a toilet, but nobody owns it. And because nobody owns it, nobody looks after it. <laughs> and in time, they just fall apart. Uh, but, and, and it's similar with, with training. So, you know, we have a, a business that trains uh, youngsters in computer training six months, but it's not free. Because we find that if you make it free, they'll come for a week, they come for the second week, and then they drop off. But if you have to pay, they will stick through the six months and get their Microsoft certificate. I have so the this... same, same experience with my trainer, Kim. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, 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 you know, whilst our heart says to us, we, we shouldn't charge the poor for education and for training. The converse is, is actually true. Uh, if you charge them a small amount, there's such a lot more buy-in. And, and, and even better, better example is our low-cost schools. We run a chain of low-cost schools where we charge $5 per child per month. Every, everything's on tablets, right? And so when I first thought, heard the, the story of, of private schools in the slums charging the poor, I thought, no, you can't do that. But the data is just so strong that, you know, the private schools perform better. So we, we, we were looking for an opportunity to make an investment in that particular area. So here, the, this couple uh, from the US who had sold out their, their publishing business, moved their whole family to the slum in Nairobi, the biggest slum in Africa, by the way, wanting to do something about education charging $5 per child per month, right? We backed them, started with one school in 2008. Today, there are 6,000 schools with 2 million kids in wow. our schools, right? All charging around $5 to $6 per child per month. And, 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 and there's a whole load of psychology related to that. When it's free, parents don't feel they have a right to be demanding, mm -hmm. right? But now they're paying, small amount, but it's still a significant amount, it's about 25% of the average income, right? They will come into the headmaster's head teacher's office and say, why isn't my daughter doing better? Why is my right. daughter doing more homework? Right, they have so skin in the game. The, there's skin in the game, they see this now as an investment, and so, so a lot of our philosophy is how can we provide products and services at the lowest price point? Uh, so there's no free, 
So there's no value of it. Mm -hmm. And then can we scale it? Can we scale it to make it profitable? Yes, I think India has had a lot of success with private schools as well. And I would assume that in your private school endeavor, the the outcome is much better too. The finished product, the level of education um, that the student receives is probably a much higher quality education than you would find in government schools. Yeah, and and we've done, we've tracked that regularly, but there's going to be a big report coming out uh, soon, very soon this year, and it'll show that. The, uh, the, the schools uh, are producing twice the learning uh, outcome. Wow, that's so really impressive. Yeah. And it's a lot of impact you're having on the world. Well, that's something that has worked. What have you tried that, that hasn't worked with social impact investing? Or what do you have your current eye on? I, I read an article about your, your lodge in, in South Africa. And you said, if I had to start it again, I probably wouldn't. It's been a lot of work. Um, maybe say a little bit about um, that endeavor and some of the roadblocks you hit. Well, that was my first sort of, um, you know, toehole into the into this whole area of social venture capital. So I asked some dumb questions. I fell in love with South Africa. I said, okay, I want to do something here. I want to build a business here which is the poorest part of South Africa? And they all said the Eastern Cape. I didn't know where it was. So it was a case of flying in several, a, a period of several years, learning, listening, uh, and so on. So long story, in the end, we decided to buy 40,000 acres of degraded farmland, okay? Can we convert this into a nature reserve? Can we fence 75 kilometers of elephant proof fencing so that we can bring big animals back into this part of South Africa for the first time in 150 years? Will they breed? Don't know. Can we build a five-star lodge and people will come and pay you know, to come? Don't know. Can we hire AIDS orphans, kids whose parents died of AIDS at an early age? Can we train them? to serve five-star guests, don't know. So those are all the unknowns. So, so this was a venture. This was money I was gonna give away anyway. So let's just go and try. Because if you don't try, you don't know. You will always live with that regret, right? If you've got it in you, you gotta get out of your system. So that was what we did. And there were lots of, lots of barriers, lots of roadblocks. Um, you know, why are you doing this crazy project? Um, it was the first year after Mandela stepped down, Tabo and Becky just became president. Everyone was predicting civil war. Um, the RAND was depreciating by the week. <laughs> Merrill Lynch was shouting at me, he says, don't send more money out. Uh, you are crazy. Uh, so, the, you know, it was, it was quite hard. Um, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of suspicion. Who, who was this, you know, Chinaman from London flying in and wanting to buy degraded farmland? You know, does he know something we don't? Is that gold here? You know, mm -hmm. is that platinum? Um, how did you solve for that? How did you, um, how did local... you convince people that you were going to create something that the community would buy into? We had local people uh, to, to sort of engage with them. And it took three years, a lot of drinking of tea, uh, building relationships. And finally, one couple who were going to retire decided they, that they would trust us. Uh, they happened to be Christians um, and trusted us. And once they came on board and sold us the island, maybe we were able then to uh, he, they were then able to encourage others to, to sell the land to us. And then we had to consolidate and do some land swaps and so on to consolidate so that we could fence up. So it was really challenging. And, you know, what we've learned, uh, Warren, is don't mess with nature. You know, restoring nature is expensive. It's hard work. You know, just don't mess it up in the first place. No, I like uh, that. 
so, so, so we're still in the throes of, of trying to restore restore the land. Well, I look forward to going to visit the lodge. Do you want to share with um, listeners the name of the lodge and where they can learn more information? The name of the lodge is Kuzuko, K-U-Z-U-K-O. Uh, if you if you go to uh, the website and just you know uh, type in Kuzuko uh, in South Africa, you'll see us. Yeah, Great. do come. And our strap line is help the poor come on safari. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It's a good tagline. So I know that you've had many other um, endeavors all over the world. Um, and one that always interests me is the business that is run out of the prisons in Singapore. Oh, yeah. Um, which has had been, that's been very successful. Would you please describe that and um, tell me why it's successful and what people might learn from that venture? What we're trying to do also uh, all the time is to look at marginalized groups. What's the best way to help these marginalized groups and also look at social problems. And one of the big social problems that we have is our prisons. And reoffending re rate is something like 60, 65% in the UK and in the US. You know, within two years, they will reoffend. Uh, we got to think of, of a better way of, of, of uh, you know, working with, with ex, ex-convicts, ex-offenders. So this was a guy who had been in prison about eight years, uh, been in three times, came out, started run, running a small call center in Singapore. Not very successfully, but his heart was to go back into prison, into Changi prison, the largest prison in Singapore, to, to build a call center. But it was so crazy that nobody would would invest, nobody would fund him. Came to us, we spent about, I guess, about six months getting to know him. Uh, and, and where we fail twice is because we backed the wrong entrepreneur. So that, on, that, that period of, of, of due diligence and getting a relationship with the entrepreneur is absolutely key. And uh, so we said, okay, we will, we will back you. Um, and, and support you. And we've ended up pre the pandemic, we employ about 80 uh, men and 100 women uh, in, in, in prison. We paid them a minimum wage, uh, about 600 sing a month. Um, and once they have money in their bank account, they can send money back to their families. And, and family relationships get restored. And we upskill them with computing skills. Everything is, is, is digital. They, they can't sort of, um, they can't dial numbers, uh, you know, by themselves. Everything is just dialed for them by, by the computer. And, uh, and we just take on contracts uh, for, for some of the blue chip companies. And then when they're released, we rehire them in the call center in the city. And the great thing about that is because most of the people working there are ex-cons themselves, ex-offenders. They don't then have to hide their background. You know, they feel a sense of, of belonging. This is their family. Um, and, and, and that's how we nurture them, help, help them to, to flourish. Uh, and real offending rate um, after four years is about two to 3%. Is this business profitable? Is it producing returns for investors? Yes, it is profitable. Uh, after about four years. Yeah, that's a, an amazing story. Um, it just makes it sustainable, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it's about uh, restoring dignity to these people. Singapore is, is, is a very kind of um, unforgiving society. You have one chance. <laughs> if you blow that one chance, you're, you're pretty much written off. And, and really nobody would back you and nobody would, would want to employ you. And uh, what, we, what, what we have here then is a way in which we can help to, to restore dignity uh, to these ex-offenders. Because some of them are not necessarily bad people, they just made bad decisions, mm -hmm. you know, and they need to be given a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance or whatever. Um, and, you know, and, and, and just a great business just a great, great way to, to sort of 
really positively help um, these ex-offenders. Well, I, I like that you said you invest in people and that you had made mistakes twice before by investing in the wrong entrepreneur. I mean, I think that is the case, whether you're talking about venture capital investing, social impact investing, oftentimes comes down to backing the right entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs yeah. are really interesting, kind of crazy individuals. Um, many times can be difficult to work with. What are you looking for when you meet with an entrepreneur? What What is the special je ne sais quoi that you want to see? We look at four things uh, in our sector. One is competence. It's not intelligence, it's competence. Because I'd rather invest in somebody who has built a business employing five people in the slum than uh, an MBA from you know, one of our Ivy League universities. So competence, uh, hard work, they have to be hardworking, integrity, you know, um, because you can have very hardworking people who are very bright, who have no integrity, they'll destroy your company, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we've seen that with, with, with the last financial uh, crisis. And then the fourth thing that, that I look for is humility, modesty. Because, you know, this is a long-term investment. You know, we, we invest 10 to 12 years. So, you know, we've got to have a relationship. Then the question is, are they, are they teachable? Uh, because running a business employing five people is very different to employing, you know, running a business employing 500 people. Along the way, are they teachable? Can, will they listen? Uh, and also, if, if there's no sense of humility about them, they will never hire people smarter than themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so this whole area of, of character, of, of humility and modesty uh, is, for me, is absolute key. Um, you know, where we've made mistakes have been because we haven't done enough, um, spent enough time with these entrepreneurs to really understand them and really get to know them. And when you realize you've made a mistake, how do you correct for that? Do you just sever the relationship with the- Oh yeah, we, should, we shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very much a VC approach, fail, fail cheap, fail early, <laughs> you know, and put like it, it down to tuition fees. Yes, fail cheap, fail early. This is yeah. the cost of education and becoming yeah. an inv a better investor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like that. And are you measuring your returns the same way that a normal venture capital- Funwood. I mean, are you talking about uh, returns in terms of IRR, et cetera? Is that how you present these ideas to potential investors? Yes. Um, so returns are based on uh, individual investors. So we have family offices who are saying to us, we can't take any returns, just give our capital back. Okay. That's great news to me, right? <laughs> that make my life a ton easier. And then you have other uh, private investors who are saying, look, you know, my bond rates are giving me 2%. You know, mm -hmm. if you can give me 2%, 3% plus all the social impact, I'm, I'm happy. So we've had individuals who are just out looking for 2 to 5%. Now with our more structured funds where we're managing money now for sovereign wealth funds, we're now mm -hmm. looking at 10, 12% per annum in local currency. Mm, wow. Okay. So we, we, we really want to make this as a real asset class so that we can say to individuals, look, carry on with your mainstream investing, carry on with your charity, but maybe do a small allocation, you know, 1% of your portfolio uh, to do this kind of social investing. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to make a difference to your overall fund performance, but if we do it well, we'll give you a capital back. If we do it really well, we'll give you some returns uh, as well. So historically, what we've seen is we've had returns at 8%, 9%, uh, at 11%. Uh, the best we've done is, is probably 5x uh, return on investment. But, but that was accidental. Yeah. You know, we, we just can't go in. You, you, you don't go building these kinds of businesses in the sum. Uh, expecting a 5x return, but that was just, right. just accidental. Yeah, well, I think there was probably some talent involved there too, knowing you. 
Um, but, you know, I do think the whole investment world is moving in this direction. We have seen this formalized in the industry through the practice of ESG. What do you think this means for social impact investing? What's the 10-year outlook? Does this, um, does this asset class, if you call it an asset class, does it continue to grow and attract more money? Or does the prospect of higher interest rates indicate that less money will flow into this asset class? I think it will grow. I think if you look at the growth of the ESG uh, funds, um, you know that has just been remarkable in terms of its growth. I think I think the millennial generation are not satisfied with just you know a, a single bottom line return. They want to see something happening. And even though ESG is imperfect, um, I, 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 I tell people ethical investing is a kind of do no harm investing and ESG investing is do less harm <laughs> investing because it, it's not perfect. And, and, and you know, com companies are in transition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, lithium mining is horrible. Cobalt mining is, is even worse, uh, but, we, you know, we have no alternatives, you know, if we want to transition into a, 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 a cleaner renewable energy, you know, for, for, for our industry. Um, so, but outside of ethical and ESG, you have this intentional impact investing, um, which is intentionally doing good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what, we, what we're seeing certainly are more and more people the, the sovereign wealth funds are basically allocating part of their capital from their A budget. Because we've been saying to them, look, if you give money as A, one, you don't know where it ends up. Two, it's very difficult to account for what kind of real transformation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they, I, I see them more and more allocating their A dollars into doing this. The British government started this. Mm -hmm. um, gone from 80 million now up to about 300 million dollars uh, into this. And we're seeing the European um, sovereign one funds doing the same. Uh, we're seeing uh, corporations doing the same. So Johnson & Johnson uh, came along to some of our conferences, have now set up um, a, their own social impact fund because I challenge them to say, look, CSR is just too easy for you guys. You know, you write a few checks here and there and, and, you know, write nice things about yourselves in the annual report. But if you're really serious about transformation, you need to be more intentional. So, you know, we've, uh, I sit on their board and we help them to do a number of, of uh, investments. Uh, initially $14 million. Now they've given us another $50 million to say, yeah, go, go, go do more. So I think we're seeing more and more uh, family offices, high net worth individuals, foundations, wanting to see more effective use of their charitable dollars, uh, you know, allocating in, in this direction. And then the, the aid people, uh, aid um, institutions and organizations also allocating. And I think we, we are also starting to see uh, financial institutions. So JP Morgan Social Finance is one of my investors. Exxon Insurance is one of my investors, Trouders Bank. Uh, so I think we will see a growth in this sector, but it's up to us to show that it can be done. Because when we first went out with the first fund, Lauren, everyone said, venture in Africa? Nah, never gonna work. Well, I think it's very exciting as far as the aid and charitable organizations go, because there are always unintended consequences of charity and aid. And one of the issues that you always see is how to measure your results. And it's very hard to do. In a for-profit world, we're very good at um, looking at the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so this gives organizations a measuring stick to say, how effective have we been? And is this sustainable? Have we built a sustainable, um, a sustainable effort so that we can now remove ourselves from the equation and the entity continues and, and continues to grow. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful trend in the right direction. Um, 
I wanted to ask you what is keeping you up at night right now? What are you most concerned with and how are you trying to address those concerns through your investment strategies? I think there are two areas. One is loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity, climate change issues. I think those are the, that's a, a big, big issue for the next decades. And the other is growing inequalities. Um, which really uh, will eventually result in uh, unstable uh, societies. Um, and those for me are the two issues. So we're looking to, to sort of see how we can um, do more proactively in those two areas because they are interrelated. So mm -hmm. one, of, one of the big projects we're gonna be looking at this year is to identify vulnerable forests that are vulnerable to deforestation surrounded by communities that are poor. Mm -hmm. And, and the, 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 the classical way in which we have done, gone about trying to preserve uh, and protect our habitat and our wildlife is just to you know, save the elephant or save the rhino and so on. And the message we've been sending out is that you know, from as far as the Westerners are concerned, your elephants are worth more, are more important than my starving child, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and that's, that's not a healthy message. And the reason why people chop, uh, chop trees down and shoot the game is because they're poor. Mm -hmm. So unless we address the poverty in the villages surrounding these uh, forests, uh, we will never, never be successful. So are your endeavors trying to address the poverty around these areas? Because I'm also thinking how the two themes are related um, through the great migration, right? So absolutely, absolutely. All of this uh, meshes together really well yeah. and will have a large impact on yeah. societies all around the world. Yeah, so, so in Budungo where there are 600 chimpanzees left, in Bindi where there are 400 gorillas left, deforestation is unsustainable. Uh, people are chopping trees because they need to they sell charcoal. Home. Right. Cook, do cooking. Um, we need to put some real enterprises into these uh, localities, improve the livelihood of people um, so that they don't need to go and chop your trees and shoot your game. Yeah. Because if we don't do that, it doesn't matter how many AK 47s you give these rangers. You know, and as parents, uh, Lauren, if, if I was a father in one of those situations, would I go and chop trees so that I can put food on the table for my family? Yeah, I of course would. I would. Yeah, of course I would. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can't blame them. You can't stop them doing this unless you give them an alternative. Yeah, it's something I often think about is just the developed market mindset and how you know in America we're sitting here or you're in the UK but in a developed market going into emerging or frontier markets and saying, well, you know, this isn't a good practice, even though we've, we've all done it for hundreds of years as our country's developed. So mm -hmm. I think being sensitive to that and looking at the root cause of what is actually causing somebody to do that. And, um, and also having a very rational view on human behavior and expecting humans to behave like humans. Yeah. Every mom wants to feed their child and every dad wants to provide for his family, so. And they want the same kind of independence that we have to choose what school they want to send their kids to, mm -hmm. choose what kind of healthcare provision they, they want, what food they, you know, they want to eat. They, they just want the same independence that we have. And to do that, they need jobs. Do you worry about the unequal distribution of COVID vaccines? Yes, because you know, if we don't address that, we're just gonna have more and more you know, variants appearing. Uh, although, I mean, the, the reality is that eventually they will burn themselves out, but you know, how long <laughs> before they burn, this, burn itself out? Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, I think we need to be a, a, a little bit more um, you know, open-minded about how we distribute the vaccine so that we, we, we don't have large reservoir uh, of, of, of uh, you know, the virus mutating away and causing, you know, the, the next variant to, to cause problems. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, Dr. Tan, I have one last question for you. It's something that I'm often thinking about, um, and I assume that you, you think about it too. You said you have two children. Um, I also have two children. And, you know, you grew up in poverty in Malaysia. Um, I feel like you're in the UK now. I'm in the US and I have a nice life. And I'm always wondering, how do I ensure my kids are not growing up in a bubble? What can I do to educate them about the world and for them to not take their life for granted, um, all these wonderful things that they have? How do I ensure that they're not growing up in a bubble? What did you do with your children to accomplish that? James, my, my, my youngest, our youngest, uh, you know, was, was, got in with with uh, not a great group of boys uh, at school and it, what we did was took them out to the game reserve got them to work there mm. building fences alongside with uh, with our black um, staff who were telling them what to do um, and you know that's the best thing to do take them out on visits did it make a huge impact on your son? Did he hate it or did he Absolutely. like it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. He was going to drop out of school uh, and all that. Um, and he's, he's ended up doing college and then did a, a master's in environmental management. And he's now working with me. And he's just about to go off to Africa. Oh, I thought uh, that's fun. So that sorted him out. So, you know, this kind of school exchange, is, is, is fantastic. You know, there, there are lessons that you can never learn in a classroom. Um, taking, taking, take your children now uh, to these places. Uh, that's the education. I agree. So is there anything that I haven't touched on today that you feel called to share with listeners? No, I think uh, the only thing I would say is we all need to leave a, 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 a legacy, but consider a living legacy rather than a legacy when you're gone. I agree. You know, so, so I think if, if there's one thing I'd encourage people to do is to think about a, a living legacy. And I didn't want to be in a position where, um, you know, my grandchildren, if I have any, if they would ask me, you know, grandpa, what did you do about um, the deforestation in, in Africa? And I didn't want the answer to be, oh, I gave some money to a charity. Or grandpa, what did you do about the inequalities in Africa? Uh, I also didn't want to say, I, I wrote a nice check, you know, regular check to one of the charities. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I just wanted to, to, to be able to say that I went and put in time and effort and money uh, to try and do something, whether it's successful or not, is, is immaterial. But start doing something, I think, is, is what I would say to listeners. Well, Kim, you can certainly um, claim that you did that. And I really appreciate your time today. I want our investors to learn that there are lots of different types of investment strategies. Um, and social impact investing has been extremely interesting to learn about today. Is there a website mm -hmm. or publication where um, my listeners can go to to learn more about your efforts or partner with you if um, if they desired? Yeah, um, either uh, contact us through the Transformational Business Network. Um, okay. So just Google trans Transformational Business Network. Or, um, yeah, that's probably the best, the best site to go visit. Uh, and you'll see a whole network. There are several thousand of us. We describe the network as a network of disillusioned philanthropists and repentant bankers. Yeah, I like it. And we'll make sure <laughs> and put the link for the Transformational Business Network in the notes to the show. Okay. Thank you again for sharing your time with me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon in person. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Thank you for listening to the Zinvesting Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, please visit our website at zinvestingpodcast.com. Happy investing and stay zen.